Is there any forgiveness for the things I've done? Is there pardon for sinners? I know that I'm one before you. Before you. Would you take this heart of foulness and make it clean again? Would you pour on me your mercy as I confess my sin before you? heart of foulness and make it clean again would you pour on me your mercy as I confess my sin Father, we need you. We need you to wash us clean. Father, we do stand before you. Father, we don't even know all our own shortcomings. You're an all-knowing, all-powerful God. You see all of our flaws. You knew every one of our flaws. You knew one of our, every one of our sins even before you reached out and you drew us to you. But you did. And we are so, so grateful, Lord. 
even in the midst of our shortcomings, you loved us first. Not only did you love us, Lord, but you have a plan for us. You have spoken a thing into being, into the heavens. You have spoken forth a plan for our lives. You have sent forth your word, and it will be completed in us. You make your face to shine on me, and that my soul knows very well. You lift me up, I'm cleansed and free, and that my soul knows very well. When mountains fall stand by the of my enemy you come back and you call it my victory yeah you 
call that my victory. You go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. Your love becomes my greatest defense. It leads me from the dry wilderness. And all I did was pray. All I did was worship. All I did was bow down. All I did was be
word says, be still and know that I am God. We're facing a trial. We're facing a temptation. We want to get involved. We want to try to solve it. But how many know that our God is a great and awesome God? How many know that he can handle, he, can, he is bigger than that problem that you have? Anybody know this God here today? How many know my God is able? My God goes before me. The Lord my God is my strength and my shield. He is my rock. He is my fortress. All I did was pray. Oh, yes. All I did was worship. Oh, all I did was bow down. All I did was be still. All I did lift our hands. Let's worship the Lord today. Would you do that? Would you just worship Him and exalt His name? Tell Him who He is. You need to hear this with your own lips. Who your God is today. He is strong and mighty in power. Would you worship Him today? Come on church. Let's worship the Lord. Let's worship Him. Let's worship the Lord today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you. just commit this time to you for your word thank you lord that in our time of trouble in our time of questions uncertainty that your word is a rock your word is that which does not change it is changeless in a changing time when everything else seems to be sifting shifting sand and it's trying to sift us the circumstances of life God, we know that we stand on your word. Your word is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It never, it's changeless because it, you have proclaimed it. You have spoken it. You have ordained it, your word. So, 
Holy Spirit, we ask that you would allow the word to infuse us today. Just marinate into our souls, into our minds, so that we can absorb the things, the holy things of God. Things that maybe we can't get any other way, but by the Holy Spirit, we pray that you would bring this into our hearts and minds and make us different, change us to be more like Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Wow, this pen says happy. Happy. Don't worry. I know. Be happy. Oh, it has a B and happy, so be happy. I like that. I don't know who put that on there, but thank you. I want to thank all those. We have been gone for two weeks, and I want to thank um, those who kept everything going. I want to thank um, our media team, which really is, you know, uh, Mark is responsible for keeping. He's the center spoke of that, and he keeps all things going on. He gave us a brand new on-air sign so that I would know when, I'm, where, when we're on the air. And I can't miss it now. There's a pink glow. So if you see pink on me, that's why. It's not because of the Barbie movie or anything like that. Okay? Yeah. I just spoiled somebody's day. I want to thank Mark, though, and got some work done here that we need to do. I want to thank Sophia for being so transparent and sharing her testimony. Would you give her a big... Thank you for that. Wonderful. Did just a fabulous job of just, just, you know, putting some things out there. I wasn't even aware of till I read her testimony and then the, just the way she wrote it out there and delivered that. Don't you appreciate that? That's hard to do. Yes. That is very hard to do. And she felt uh, led to do that. So thank you, Sophia. I want to also thank, um, you know, all of our musicians, those who've just you know, kept things going, especially Tim, and who, you know, has had to kind of shoulder the responsibility of praise and worship a little bit more lately, although he was gone. But when he got back, the surprise was Sherry had an operation on her shoulder, and so, you know, we've had to kind of do without her, and so thank you to all those, though. Sherry, Sherry, uh, Speaking of shouldering, even though she had a shoulder operation, she shouldered the responsibility till Tim got back. So um, it's just taken everybody. I, I just want you to know how much we appreciate you. And we got, we got to watch you on our TV down there in Florida. Um, and uh, we went to two other churches. We went to um, a big church in Tampa. My cousin was preaching that day, and it was really fun to be there very multicultural church um, in the heart of Tampa. A wonderful place to be. Great spirit of worship there. And then we last Sunday we were at a smaller, more I'd say it was still very multicultural. A lot of Hispanic, black families, uh, old white people like me who were retired. And it was just a wonderful mix, though, of new Christians and classic Pentecostals and it was, they were getting ready for VBS, and they had a big castle set up. Boy, I love seeing that, you know, ministry to kids like that. So it was exciting to be in those different places, and um, my, cousin, my other cousin was leading worship. I got cousins everywhere, so just don't talk about me ever, okay? <laughs> don't ever talk about me, because somebody is related to me, or Mary. So, yeah. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Okay, I'm getting cues from the front pew here. She didn't want me to forget Kelsey. But last but not least, I wanted to say thank you to Kelsey. Um, she preached last week. Would you give her a big hand? Did a wonderful job. Fantastic. Just I love what God is doing through your life. And she was our. She was my point man. Even though she's a lady, she was my point man. You know, and just kept the pulpit all organized. And she was the one that people could come to for questions. She did what I do on any given Sunday, and I might just let her keep doing that. So <laughs> she did better than I did today. But um, just thank you so much, Kelsey. Everybody, I know Don and Nancy do so much, and they, you know, they keep the donuts going. They keep this place clean. These, listen, folks. When the bathrooms are clean and you got good donuts and coffee, what more do you need in church, okay? 
donuts, coffee, and bathrooms, all right? Because they, they go together. But no, thank you so much uh, to each and every one. I know I'm probably forgetting somebody, but we appreciate all of you. You know, it's just a family here. We are just a family. That's what church should be. And this is the Light and Kent family, and my name is uh, Larry Knoll. I'm the senior pastor here, the lead pastor, and so glad that those of our, that are joining us through um, video today, through our streaming service, we sure appreciate that. Come and see us sometime in Kent, Ohio. We'd love to have you here. I want us to go to the book of Luke. Now, I had a series planned, and I'm, I'm not going to go into it. I will tell Kelsey more about this later, but we, we were, I had a five-part series planned and was going to work on that while I was gone, and it didn't work out. So I went back to some things that I'd done before, and um, I'll tell you about where the sermon came uh, from and what inspired me for it. But it's Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. I'm going to read from the King James Version, okay? The one that the apostles used, right? And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So who's he? Jesus. Who's they? His disciples, okay? And he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said to them, unto them, Occupy till I come. Say those, those words with me. Occupy till I come. Now that's our, a message to us today, that we are to occupy until he comes. So... There's a book, all right, it was written in 1926 by a doctor. His name is Samuel Bell, and he used opinions and stuff from other doctors back in 1926 and medical institutions that were available, and they came together and collaborated and came up with a book called What to Do Till the Doctor Comes. Anybody ever hear about this book? Elizabeth, you might have heard about it. It was a little red book. And you could find it online. I was actually reading parts of it online. It was kind of cool. It was a actual digitized, but it was the actual book I was reading. Like it was old crink- crinkly looking pages. It was digital, but it was real. You know, it was kind of cool. And I was reading this, and listen, this was a very popular book. Very popular book back in its day. Because back in the day, You didn't have some of the things that we have today. Mainly transportation in 1926 was very primitive. Think about this. So you had what? Walking. We all know about how slow that is. We also had horses and horse and buggy. Okay? Maybe some automobiles, but not very many people could afford an automobile not in every household, surely, okay? So doctors made house calls. It's kind of cool. They would make their rounds, and they would go see people, their patients, and they would go visit them. Wouldn't that be kind of nice today in a way? Problem is, we're never at home. <laughs> they would show up, you know, hello, I'm here for your vaccines. You know, I'm here to, you know, to give you your medicine. And we, they go, oh, you know, they're not home. They're over somewhere else. But if he was coming by buggy or mule or he was walking, it would take a while. You could die waiting for the doctor, in other words. So if you got hurt out on your farm or your homestead or even in the city, you didn't have something like Teladoc. I love Teladoc. I use Teladoc a lot. You know, I get on my phone and my company provides this for free for me and I get on there and... I never hardly ever go to the doctor except for yearly physicals. It's like, oh, you know, I think I have a sinus infection. And I get on there and my doctor, you know, he looks at me with the camera and I say, it hurts here and here and, you know, and he goes, okay, and he prescribes and I'm done. No doctor's visit. I don't have to go in with a bunch of sick people and, yeah, and spread my sickness. So it's really kind of cool. But back then you had to wait for the doc. 
It wasn't tell a doc, it was wait for a doc, okay? Totally different system. So on this premise of this self-help book that I'm talking about, that I'm, you know, going into a little bit of detail about, when someone is injured or becomes sick, there's this gap, isn't there, of time. From the time you get sick or you get injured until somebody comes to help you. I remember Nancy when she fell off that ladder. How long were you there, laying there, going, I've fallen and I can't get up? 45 minutes. minutes. And she had crushed her ankle, right? Crushed it. And what? And her knee. Now, you should see her. She goes out and, and she's running all over the place nowadays. You know, you wouldn't even know she was ever hurt. But there was this 45 minute gap. And back then it was even, it could be hours till you got medical help. Because don't forget, if you didn't have a telephone, you had to send somebody for the doc. Then you had to wait till he could come. And it would so at least take twice as much time, if not more. And so that's why this book was so important because of slow transportation. Today we have 911. It's wonderful. Well, sort of. (laughs) Depending where you live, I checked out that it it really depends where you live. There are places where 911 is like that. And then if you live in Washington, D.C., just start walking, okay? (laughs) And most police departments, I found out, have a response schedule that ranks different types of emergencies from high to low. Mark could probably tell you in detail about that. They don't go running out immediately maybe for some things that have happened. They do for other things. They triage it, okay? And so the top priority always goes to callers who are in need of assistance due to a life-threatening emergency. That makes sense, doesn't it? And in most cities, response times are actually in minutes, not hours. Most cities, okay, in most situations. So it's no wonder that that book has kind of gone by the wayside. In minutes, by the time you found it and read it, the EMT is at your door, right? So it wouldn't do you much good. You might Google something, uh, and you could probably find it on, what is that, MD something? WebMD, Web that's it. Mary's, she spends a lot of time there, okay, because she's investigating my illnesses all the time. So, in its day, this little book may help to save a life, or at the very least, keep a condition from getting worse. And that's why that book was so popular. There's some interesting things in there, if if you ever care to read it. But I was thinking about the word first aid. First aid. We say first aid, just like it's one word or whatever. But we don't even think about first aid. But first aid comes from the thought of the first or immediate assistance that's given to a person. Think about that. First aid is like, until the doctor comes, we need to do something. What can we do? We got to stop the bleeding. We have to wash out the wound or we have to make them comfortable or get them warm or whatever the case may be. That's first aid. Okay. The second aid is the real medical person. The first aid is somebody like you or me that's maybe trained, maybe not, But we pull out that little box with the cross on it, you know, and we start digging through there looking for stuff to uh, help somebody. And it might preserve a life. Uh, It may prevent the condition from worsening. Or it may promote recovery until the medical services arrive at your door. But first aid, think about this now. Where am I going with this? You're saying, why is he talking about this? This is church. First aid is occupying See, we think of occupying as just standing around. Go occupy that space. Okay? But that's not what the Jesus meant by occupy. You know, we think, I think most churches really believe that. That occupy just means show up. And then plant your rear end in a seat and go back home. That's occupying. That is not what that word means. That is not the intent of that word. I don't believe that Jesus had for his disciples. Because we see, he sent them out, didn't he? He sent them out to do what he had been doing. To do the same miracles. Raise the dead. heal, the, uh, Give sight to the blind. Heal the sick. So, I believe we should look at that word, occupying, as be ready. That's the watch word I think we should look at. Be ready. In other words... 
People back in the day were using that little book to prepare for the doctor's arrival. I'm going to do what I can till the expert gets here. Because delayed action could cost a life, right? It could be the difference between, if you can keep somebody from going into shock, Sometimes that's a very simple thing to do, but if you don't do it, somebody would go into shock. They could die. So let's look at Matthew 24, 44. It says, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Now, of course, this is talking about the coming of Jesus when he comes back. The Son of Man will come at an hour when you don't expect him, so you must also be ready. You should be occupying. You should be applying first aid until he comes. So how can we be ready for the coming of Christ? Aren't we already born again? Why would he say be ready when we're already? I thought we were ready. I thought we had tickets to heaven already. I thought we already were born again and we're good, right? Why would we have to, what's be ready now? What is that about? And the Bible is clearly instructing us here, be ready, occupy, prepare for the return of the bridegroom. So let's name this, what to do until Jesus comes today. And I got this inspiration from my grandmother. I pulled up one of her, she has, I inherited books of her sermons because she was an old-time preacher old-time pentecostal preacher and i was looking through some of them the other day when i got home from vacay and i looked at this and i said what to do what to do until the doctor comes what kind of sermon is that and i began reading through her ideas so some of that is in this sermon today i'm happy to say her name was mamie west okay and she was a church planner and she was a evangelist in the church of god for over 50 years. And she wrote a sermon based on this book, and I want to just take her cues from this book on what to do until the doctor comes. So one of the things she wrote was, you need to look for symptoms. I was like, that's good. Because symptoms are danger signals, aren't they? When something's not normal in our body, then we know, well, what? And we'll Google it. What does it mean if I have a rash on my face? What does it mean if I have a pain over here? You know, you put that in, or if you use chat, chat GPT or one of those AIs, then same thing, you'll get these kinds of answers. A sign of a disease basically can be any departure from normal in your body. We know our bodies. We know what's normal. And when we start experiencing something that's not normal, we, we think to ourselves, I'll probably be okay tomorrow. And we ignore it, especially when you get older, guys. When you get to be my age, pain is every day, someplace, okay? It moves around. And today, my feet are great, but for some reason, my neck is killing me. And I thought the neck bone was connected to the foot bone, but, you know, some of you know that song, okay? But a wrong diagnosis, I don't know if you've ever been to a doctor and they've given you the wrong diagnosis, it can be fatal to a patient. They're, they're trying to fix something that's not broke, and the thing that's broken you is not getting fixed, it's getting worse. So time is of the essence in treatment. And so let's look at some of the symptoms and treatments in this little red book and how they can teach us what to do until Jesus comes. I want to be ready. I want to be occupying as he told me to do, don't you? I don't want to just be waiting around for Jesus to come back and complain about things. What can I do? How can I be what he wants me to be? So I looked at one of the things. It was a foreign body in the eye. Now remember, these are antique descriptions, 1926. They're probably something else you would call that today. Have you ever had anything in your eye? Now I'm not talking about a speck of dust. I'm talking about one time I was adjusting at work a, a, a vent. And, you know, they're made out of aluminum, something like that one over there. And I was trying to adjust it, and a little curled, like a pigtail, curled piece of aluminum came down, dropped right into my eye. And what do you do? You go like this. And guess what? That little piece of metal screwed right into my eye. And for days, my eye was just watering and red, and I was like, man, this is not getting better, you know. 
And the doctor, I went into the eye doctor, and he literally pulled that little piece out, and it had left residue. Then he took a, he numbed my eye, and then he took some kind of a little drill, and he drilled the metal residue out of my eye, and then I passed out. Okay. <laughs> Because once I, once I smelled that, once I smelled my flesh burning with my eye flesh, that smell, I went, whoop, see you later, poof. <laughs> I just fell backwards. I, was, I had my chin in this harness, and I just went, whoop. <laughs> Doctor thought I had died on him, but I just was like, okay, I'm not in for this, okay? But the first thing this little red book says is don't rub your eye. Because that's exactly what you feel like you want to do. And, you know, and you're reading a book going, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> it says to do something. Close your eyes and let the increased flow of tears wash away those particles. That's the first thing you can try doing. Now, I've done the eyelid extension method, too, you know, where you pull it out over your chin, you know, and you try to, you try to get it out and, and use the eyelashes on the bottom. Sometimes that works. Well, let's look at this spiritually. Has, did you ever get somebody else's speck in your eye? Spiritually speaking, I'm talking about here. What am I talking about? Something bugs you about somebody else. You're like, <laughs> yeah. Matthew, let's go to Matthew and talk about this, the speck in the eye. Matthew 7, verse 1. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Wow. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye? When all the time there is a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite. Whoa. <laughs> is this Jesus? First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You see, we, there was a song I taught kids years ago. It was called Eye Trouble. It says, we got eye trouble. Everybody's looking out for number one. Me, myself, and what's going to become of all this eye trouble? Yeah. This is what we as Christians who are supposed to be occupying, we start judging one another, don't we? We start looking around the room, comparing. Until Jesus comes, could we just try something and, not, and quit judging other people? And that includes people that aren't in this room, people out here somewhere, maybe they're not Christians. Would you quit judging people? Could we just do that? Could we take the two-by-four out of our eye first? In other words, could we quit worrying about the speck of sawdust in somebody else's eye and work on that two-by-four that's across ours? So the treatment for this, I told you we would have treatments, is when someone else agitates us, when we're irritated by what we see in other people, whatever it is, guys, I'm talking about whatever, let's do exactly like the little red book says. Let's close our eyes. Yeah, and let's pray for them. Wouldn't that be good? Until the tears of compassion flow to remove that irritation we have. You see, when we pray for somebody, we're now involved with them. We're not judging them. We're on their team now, and we're saying, God, and we don't want to pray like the Pharisee. God, thank you that I'm not like them. Ooh. No, we're saying, God, I don't know what their situation is. It looks messed up to me, but I don't know. I don't live that life. Would you just help them? And if I can help them, help me help them. Okay? We need to close our eyes and ask God to deal with the sin in our own lives. Don't tell me there's no sin. Don't tell me there's no junk in your life. There is. There's in mine. There's in yours. We deal with it. Deal with your stuff first. I'll deal with my stuff first. And I'm not going to judge the person that I'm looking at that's irritating me. Until Jesus comes, we should just close our eyes to other people's faults and start dealing with our own stuff. Can I get an amen? amen. Thank you. I hate to ask for it because that was such a good point. But 
Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do, Kelsey. All right. Let's look at another thing. Fractured bones. What to do till the doctor comes. There's two kinds of fractures, simple and compound fractures, basically. I know there's variations. I know we have medical people here. Simple, basically, the bone is, remember, this is 1926. The simple is bone is broken, no outward wound. Okay? A compound fracture, Nancy, the bone, and Warren, the bone is broken and it pierces your skin. Did you all have that happen to you? Yeah. No? You kept all your broken bones inside of you? Okay. A compound can be caused by falling, a sharp blow, or by crushing. A crushed bone is basically the hardest to heal, and it usually leaves some kind of a deformity. So what's the treatment? You immobilize the limb, and you set the bone by binding it up in a cast or a splint. All right? So let's talk about spiritual fractures. Okay? Did you enjoy the eye trouble? Well, you're really going to enjoy this. Spiritual fracture is broken unity with God. It's broken fellowship with God. Now, we, there's a term in the Bible that people get in big arguments about. And it's, whenever you talk about grace, you can, have, you can have people that fall on two or three sides of the word grace. Okay? But there's a term in Galatians 5, 4. It says, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Now, some people think this is talking about backsliding. It's not. It's not, okay? You've become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law. Did you catch that? You become estranged from Christ. You become separated. You know what estranged is? It's like married people that don't want anything to do with each other right now. Or a, a, a father and a, and, a, and a daughter, let's say, who get so mad at each other over something, they're estranged. They don't want anything to do with each other right now, okay? You become estranged from Christ. Why? You who attempt to be justified by law. Those who are trying to be good enough to do the right things to be saved, to earn their salvation, basically, right? You have fallen from grace. That's how you fall from grace. I don't need grace. I can do it myself. I will do it myself. And when we begin to think our words, our works rather, save us, instead of relying on God's grace, that's His gift of love, by the way. When we don't rely on His grace because He loved us first, listen, guys, His grace sets us free. Free from what? Not just free from our sin, but free from the condemnation that sin brings. I don't have to work to be saved. I don't have to do something. Now, you're going to find out next week we're going to talk about works. Okay? That faith without works. Well, we're not talking about that right now. To be saved, to be in God's family, it doesn't require me to have works in other words i'm going to mess up and the problem is when we try to become perfectionist spiritually and we you know we try to get all of our ducks in a row and we're gonna you know we do start judging others because that way we can well you know i got nine out of ten right they got about six out of ten right i'm much better than them you see this is what happens when we keep score we keep scoring others too 2 Corinthians 12, 9, NIV says this, but he, said, but he said to me, my grace is what? Sufficient. It's sufficient for you. My, for my power is made perfect in weakness. We're supposed to be weak. We're not supposed to be strong enough to live for Jesus. We're not supposed to be strong enough to, be, to uh, live the Christian life. Guys, it's too hard. It's impossible without Jesus, without His grace. 
Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. So if Paul wasn't all that, I certainly am not all that. Falling from grace causes us to live broken and bruised lives. Listen close. There are Christians that live broken and bruised lives even though we have forgiveness through Jesus. They're continuing to live broken and bruised lives even though their sins are forgiven, they have a home in heaven, they have fellowship with Christ, and, and this is what leads to a broken relationship with God, is we don't trust Him with our spiritual self. You need some help, God. Surely, this is not all there is to live in the life. And we try to make it about what we do instead of whose we are and the relationship there. That's where it's at. And what this does is this leads to failure. This leads to discouragement. And we become estranged from God because of that. We take it out on him, on that relationship. So what's the treatment? Spiritual fractures can be healed by bringing our discouraged, broken heart and mind to God. You just offer that to him and say, I messed up. I've been trying to do this in my own strength, and I cannot. Would you please help me? You know what? That's what he wants you to say anyhow. And I love this verse in, I won't read this, but Ephesians 5.26 in NIV, it says, by the washing with water through the word. Now, this is about husbands, the way they treat their wives as Christ loved the church. And it's, it's saying, by the washing with water through the word. And I said, that's an interesting term. Because water was used for ceremonial cleansing back then. Okay. We were just watching an episode about this in The Chosen, and their cistern broke, and they had no fresh water, and it was upsetting the worship, not just washing clothes and cooking, but the main cistern where they got their water from was also used for worship. What were they going to do? They couldn't wash before they worshiped. It was a thing they had to do. And the Word of God teaches us, though, that we have been eternally cleansed by Jesus' death and resurrection his death on the cross and then his resurrection from the dead we have been eternally cleansed okay and so he's saying by the washing with water through the word if we feel broken if we feel unworthy if we feel unloved we need to do like you would with a broken ankle or a knee immobilize yourself what are you talking about Come as you are. Quit trying. Stop. Stop what you're doing and come to Jesus just as you are. That's our sign as you come in the door. Come as you are. Don't try to fix it anymore. Don't try to do anything else. You've done enough. Come to Jesus. Amen? Amen. And guess what? He will bind your wounds with a cast of love until you, healing and restoration is complete. So yes, we want to work for Jesus. Yes, we want to do things for Jesus, but you cannot work and earn your salvation or make Jesus love you more or he will not accept you more. Guys, he's done everything he can to prove his love for you. That's what we're trying to say. We'll talk about works next week. Okay? And don't take next week off because i'm doing that because it's good let's talk about oh a couple others here fainting this is one of my favorite pastimes used to be like whenever i would get a shot or get a blood sample womp i would just it was like i would say okay where can i lay down and they go we're just gonna i go i don't care where can i lay down you know and literally, if I had to lay on the floor for a doctor or a nurse to do this, I would lay on the floor, you know, because I was just like, Whoa. okay, until I learned how to deal with this, and it's not an issue anymore. But how many have ever fainted? How many have ever passed out? Have you ever, okay, 
What made you faint? All right? What, I mean, what is fainting? Why does that happen? I mean, basically, it's this loss of consciousness. How do you go from, hey, how you doing, to womp, okay? Everything turns black. For me, it kind of turns like white, gray, and then black. And then I feel so good when I wake up. I'm like, man, I just, I feel great. What happened? You know, and then people are standing around looking at me like, oh, I'm on the floor. <laughs> I passed out once when I was getting a, a blood test. I was getting a blood test, and I stood up. They, I said, lay me down in this examination chair. So they laid me down like a do, uh, dentist chair. I literally stood up in the chair as I was blacked out. I was fighting to not black out. So I literally stood up and was passed out standing up. Now, that's a new one probably for any doctor, okay? <laughs> but if you notice a person about to faint, they say, Alex, come up here. I need you. They say you should do this. This is an old remedy, okay? Sit down. Spread your legs a little bit, like guys do, and put your head between your knees, right? This is to keep you. Has anybody ever heard of this? No, go down. Go down, way down, okay? <laughs> this is supposed to, if this doesn't help you not faint, okay, it's just going to make you very uncomfortable. But, okay, thank you very much. Let's give Alex a big hand, okay? Many followers of Christ, we also faint, don't we? We lose heart. We get discouraged. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Therefore we do not lose heart, Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're renewed day by day. The present world that we're living in, I understand. The troubles, the trials, the frustrations, the persecutions that we feel are on us. There is a treatment for spiritual fainting, though. Because I know there's just sometimes we just feel like it's not worth it. It's too hard. Isaiah 40, 31. You know I'm going to read this. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. It mentions fainting in the Bible. It's right there. So where do we find our hope? Where do we find our hope? By bowing our head in prayer. See, bowing our head in prayer, just like this is supposed to help me not pass out. It never worked for me. <laughs> bowing our head in prayer will work. Because the Bible is promising that. If we wait on the Lord, stop what you're doing right then. Bow your head in prayer. Seek the Lord. It's a promise, guys. It's one of those promises. You will not faint. He will give you what you need to soar. 1 Timothy 2, 8. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disrupting. Pray. That is what to do until Jesus comes. Can I do one last one real quick? Freezing or hypothermia. That was not in the book. The book said freezing. But I was like, isn't there a different word we use for that? Hypothermia. What to do till the doctor comes? Due to, it comes when we get, you know, and living up here in the north, I just came from 100 degree weather, by the way, down in Florida. It is very, at times, uncomfortable. But here we know the other extreme, don't we, where we feel like it's 100 below or something, you know. It's just really cold and it stinks. We don't want to do anything. And we can, be, we can get hypothermia due to exposure to extreme cold for long periods of time. The symptoms are numbness, drowsiness, fatigue, eventually unconsciousness. And the remedy is get a person warm. Make, contain, you know, get that body heat so it's not escaping. You know, so sometimes if you have nothing else, you lay on that person Oh, and you try to, you know, use your own body heat to keep there and, and stimulation like this, you know, making them, you know, using your limbs and things like that. Well, there's something called spiritual freezing, in case you didn't know that. Which is overexposure to the brutal elements of life. 
of our society. And the symptoms are numbness to the inner voice to the, of the Holy Spirit. Woo. You ever get there? It's like, you know, I don't, I don't hear from God. Well, he's talking, but you've become numb because of all the stuff that is coming down on us and our mind goes like, goes crazy. And now we're not hearing anything on this high level anymore. All we're hearing is this low level stuff down on the ground. Drowsiness. It happens in spiritual freezing. It's called malaise. What does it matter? What's ever going to change? Right? I pray. I never see nothing happen. Ooh, we don't want to get there. But that's spiritual freezing. How about fatigue? We get tired of fighting the good fight, don't we? I just can't. You know, somebody else is going to go have to witness to people. Somebody else is going to have to hand out bottles of water. Somebody else is going to have to, you know, work in the church nursery. Somebody else is going to have to clean those toilets. I mean, I just, you know, I can't. Somebody else is going to have to deal with my family. They're a bunch of idiots, you know. I, who cares? It's not going to change anyhow. See, we get that fatigue from the things that we face. Sometimes serving the Lord in our ministry, we get fatigued. And then there's unconsciousness that comes. It's like the human body. The human body will, will go into shock to conserve resources, they tell me, right? Is that right? You know, we can go into spiritual shock for the same reason. Self-preservation. Don't care about anybody else. We shut down relationships. We're incapable of reaching out and loving other people now. And wonder why we don't have friends. Wonder why nobody cares. Well, it's a two-way street. And this is real. Spiritual freezing is real. And it happens to the best of us. Is that not right? It happens. If it hasn't happened, it probably will at some point in our life. It's kind of like a human nature thing. And I'm not here to condemn. I am not here to condemn anybody if that's where you are. But I'm here to tell you, you don't have to stay there. Amen. If you're there, you don't have to stay there. But this requires cooperation. It usually takes somebody else to help you get unfroze. Like I said, you might have, you know, somebody might have to lay over top of you if nothing else or find a blanket or something that's going to keep that heat in. Isolating yourself, my friend, from fellow Christians is not the answer. What amazes me is when people get into a place in their life of spiritual freezing, they stay away from church. And I'm like, can I just slap you or something? You know, because you're not thinking. You are not thinking. That's the very thing that you need right now. And the, the very thing you're doing is isolate yourself from people that will bring warmth to your life. They will help carry you to a place that you need to get to that you can't get on your own. But you're isolating yourself and you're going to become unconscious. Yes. You need the help of others to lift you up. And when we're, when we're on our back, so to speak... We need other followers of Christ to help us, to help revive us sometimes. And guess what? When somebody's on their back and they've become unconscious from freezing, what do people have to do to get them up? They kneel down next to them, don't they? And they get their hands under them. And it usually takes three or four people. And they'll pick them up, right? But the first thing they do is what? They kneel. And it amazes me. They will kneel down to pick you up. But if we don't know what's going on in your life, we don't know how to pray for you. Is there somebody you can confide in? That you can say, hey, brother, sister, I need you to pray for me. See, you need praying Christians around you. Yeah. That's what this is about. That's why just watching on YouTube is not going to hack it. Brothers and sisters in Christ who will pick you up in their arms, who will love you and bring warmth back to you if you let them come close, who will stimulate you 
with their fellowship. That's what we need sometimes. So that's what makes our men's and ladies groups so vital, by the way. James 5.16, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. I don't want you standing up here doing that. I don't want you to get up and say, Okay, folks, this week I had this bad thought. No. That's what the small groups and men's and ladies groups are for, guys. That's what it's for. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So you can get up off of the, your back. You can get the life back in you. You can get the warmth back in you. It says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And that's where we will get accountability, prayer, support, love, fellowship, everything we need is a follow of Christ. Romans 15.1 says this, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. What are we supposed to use our energies for? At times, it's going to be to lift a brother or a sister up who's failing, who's about to freeze to death spiritually. This is what we do until Jesus comes. We occupy until he comes. This is not all inclusive, but I love what my grandmother wrote here. When she looked at that book, it made her think. We need to close our eyes to others' faults until he comes. And let's spend some time looking at ourselves, right? We need to come as we are to Him with our brokenness, our unworthy feeling that we have. Oh, God, I can't even come to you. Yes, you can. That's exactly how I want you. That unloved feeling, let Him love you. Every other love may have let you down. His love will never let you down, my friend. And let Him bind you with that cast of love and healing, and restoration. How do we occupy? We pray. We wait on the Lord. We get our strength renewed. This is stuff we do. This is how to occupy. We join with others in the church. The church is super important, guys. This is not optional. This is important. That's where we get accountability, support, care, and we bear each other's burdens. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, thank you for the church. Thank you for a place where believers, followers of Christ, come together. And there's just times we we're here to apply first aid to one another sometimes. We don't even know that's what we're doing. But we're here supporting. We're here praying for one another. We're here lifting each other up. There's times, God, where... Maybe it doesn't involve another person. Maybe it's something that we're doing or we we're not doing that we should be. God, help us to occupy until you come. Though We believe you're coming soon, by the way. We believe that you are coming soon. We really do. But help us not to just sit around and be discouraged and just let all these ailments, spiritual ailments, come on us. But let's move forward, God. Help us to be encouraged today, Lord, to seek you, to come before you, to let you give us strength, God, to, to warm us up spiritually so that we stay in the fight, so to speak. We ask, God, we ask this for your grace, Lord, that we would operate and live in your grace. There's no other way. There's no other way just trusting and obeying you. There's no other way to live, God. We cannot. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in, who lives in me. So God, I pray for each and every saint of God who's hearing this today. Every follower of Christ. God, help us to stay in the game. Help us, Lord, to use this first aid kit of your word. And to look at the things, Lord, that keep us from serving you and to keep us out of the game, Lord. There is a remedy for all this. It's found in your word. It's found in your word. And we thank you for that, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would bring these things to our memory when we need them. And that we would encourage one another with this, Lord. I pray for those today that don't know you who are not walking with Jesus Christ. And I pray that they, they may be searching for answers. They, and I know that they are. 
And I pray, God, that the Holy Spirit will touch them right now and quicken this, the Word of God to their mind, meaning that it will be applied to their situation, that it will connect up with their need right now. Holy Spirit, touch that one who is lost today and let them know they are found in Jesus' name. I pray that you would come to accept Jesus today. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Tim, lead us in a song of worship, if you would. Never said it would be easy. You never said there'd be no pain. But you promised you'd go with me. And your promises you always keep. Lord, I confess how much I need you. I confess that I am a weak. I can't promise I won't fail you, but your promises will not fail me. When I'm in the valley, I will fear no evil. When enemies surround me, you prepare a table. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Anyhow, we just encourage you to reach out to us. If you have a prayer request, uh, we'd love to connect with you on that. We'll be praying for you tomorrow if you'll send that to us today. Uh, or if you just put any kind of a comment, let us know that you're watching. Whenever this is, it could be a year from now, we would love to hear from you. God bless you.